ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى اله واصحابه وسلم تسليما كثيرا يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن الا وانتم مسلمون يا ايها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحده وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والارham ان الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم اعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم وَمَن يُطِعِ اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ فَقَدْ فَازَ فَوْزًا عَظِيمًا أَمَّا بَعْدُ فَإِنَّ خَيْرَ الْهَدْيِ كِتَابُ اللَّهِ وَخَيْرَ الْهَدْيِ هَدْيُ مُحَمَّدٍ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ وَشَرَّ الْأُمُورِ مُحْدَثَاتُهَا وَكُلُّ مُحْدَثَةٍ بِدْعَةٌ وَكُلُّ بِدْعَةٍ ضَلَالَةٌ وَكُلُّ ضَلَالَةٍ فِي النَّارِ All praises are due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who has created us and blessed us with Islam May Allah's mercy and blessings be on his last prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Often we talk about following the sunnah. Every second or third speech you will hear, you will find that people talk about adhering to the Quran and the sunnah. But what is sunnah? We have as a Muslim a vague belief about sunnah. We basically know what sunnah is but still in our understanding there are something which actually causes us to fall into some traps the general meaning of sunnah which we understand uh, as the normal people would un- understand like which is not farz maybe or something that rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam did all these are true however this is not complete the word sunnah comes from the root sanan it actually means way direction path so when we say that is it is the sunnah of rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam it actually means the way of rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam however depending on the context the meaning of sunnah differs there are three implications number 1 fiqh if we describe the word sunnah according to fiqh we say sunnah means something which is not obligatory example the two rakah after zuhur two rak'ah after zuhur we call it sunnah but that is in terms of fiqh that means that this is not obligatory on you the second number 2 is from the hadith perspective that means that sunnah consists of four things of rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam Number 1 his call what he said number 2 the fail what rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam actually did number 3 taqreer what actually he approved means tacit approval something was done in front of him or said in front of him and he didn't object to it he approved and number 4 is the sifat of rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam how he ate how he uh, lived how Uh, he looked all these four things consist the sunnah in terms of hadith and this context is the most general and, and there is another context which is aqeedah in terms of aqeedah sunnah means belief so when we say ahli sunnah wal jamaa what actually means is who believes who actually follow the beliefs of rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam and the sahabas 
So it doesn't really mean that certain sunnah you follow, that is not actually what Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah means. So that's why when big scholars like Ahmed ibn Hanbal, they wrote books and called it as sunnah, us usul sunnah. That was nothing about hadith. That was ba basi basically a book on aqidah. So you see, sunnah has different meanings. But in general, what we mean by sunnah is the middle one, the hadith perspective. So when we say follow the sunnah, we mean to say the follow in the hadith perspective. Now there, out of these four things, the qawl, fail, takrir, these three are enjoined on us. But number four, the sifat, it is not enjoined. For example, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa when he used to sleep, he slept, he slept and uh, his nose made a sound. You know? And then we are not bound to follow that. So that's not enjoined upon us. So that's his uh, sifat. But the other three, what he said, what he did, and what was done in front of him, with his approval, these are the basis of our faith. So when we derive ruling, we derive ruling on the basis of these three things. Now, there is another word, what we say hadith. Hadith has also some few different meanings. In linguistically, hadith means new, opposite of qadim, opposite of old. So something new is called hadith. Also, the words, it is also called as hadith. In the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has used this word hadith for four different meanings. One of them is the Quran. Fazani wa mayyukazibu bi hadal hadith. Then leave me alone with those who reject this communication, means the Quran. In this verse, hadith means the Quran. Where, if you go to another uh, surah, hal ataka hadithu Musa. Have you heard about the story of Musa? So in this verse, hadith means story, history, historical story. And then another verses, it will say that about conversation. Hadith means conversation. In terms of this conce concept, context of sunnah, hadith actually means similar, the four things of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now, is there a difference between hadith and sunnah? Yes. There is a difference between sunnah and hadith. If we, I don't want to make it too much complicated, but if we put it this way, hadith is a physical documentation of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa life. That means what has been written, documented with the chain, with the matan, that is, in a physical documentation, it is called hadith. Where sunnah is more abstract, abstract concept of what Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa life was. So that means that when we get a hadith, maybe from Bukhari, maybe from Muslim, Ahmad, then when it is proven authentically, then we call it sunnah. So that is the reason they wouldn't find any daif sunnah or maudu sunnah. But there would be sahih hadith, maudu hadith, daif hadith. Because hadith is more physical documentation. So that actually stipulates the hadith and sunnah. Now, some people would give, try to give different explanation of sunnah. We have to remember this study of usul al-hadith is a complete study. It's a science. And this is one science that is unmatched throughout the history of the world. We have to go and study more about our glorious assets. One of these is Usul al-Hadith. Now, this Usul, this study, science, has been established by scholars. If I come today and give a different definition, that will not be accepted, because it's a finished science. As if you, in algebra, one a plus b whole square equals to a square plus 2 AP plus B square, there is a set rules. If I come now today and give a different description, it will not be accepted. Similarly, with the hadith, all these terminologies, definitions are defined by the scholars. However, there are groups 
people try to redefine so that it matches with their works. For example, someone will say that if you find a hadith in Bukhari or Muslim, it doesn't mean that that would be sunnah. Authentically proven, but that wouldn't be sunnah. Why? Because according to them, the sunnah would be some of the practices of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa came through the sahabas and famous among us. So if you go to the subcontinent, you will find lots of practices, very famous, and they will call them sunnah. However, they will argue against other things where Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa used to uh, when he used to pray, he used to put uh, um, the granddaughter on his shoulders. So this is an authentic hadith, but people will say, if that is the sunnah, then we have to pray with the, with the kids on our shoulder. Otherwise, we are not following the sunnah, are we? This is a lame excuse. Because, as we said, hadith, hadith in the terms of sunnah has different meanings. It could be obligatory, it could, could be sunnah, it could be mubah, in fiqh description. Um, let me give you an example. A sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is to pray five times in the mosque, in the jama'ah. Okay. Does that mean praying five times in the jama'ah is sunnah? No, it's wajib. Everyone knows that. And it is established by the scholars that it is wajib. So even though it's called sunnah, it could be wajib. However, Rasulullah used to play, pray that two raka after Zuhur. So that becomes sunnah. In some cases, Rasulullah used to go uh, to the mosque after doing wudu, after kissing his wife. He didn't do the wudu and went to the mosque. That is not wajib on us. So this is a permissibility. So sometimes sunnah will describe permissibility. Otherwise, our uh, practice will be very narrow. So that is the concept of sunnah. So, if Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has prayed with a kid on his shoulder, we don't have to replicate that. However, we should, we should know that that is acceptable when it is needed. But some people, they try to push one way or other and try to redefine sunnah. And the other doubt people pose on the hadith, they will say another two things. Number one, they will say that, how do we know hadith was preserved? Bukhari came 250 years uh, later, Muslim came 250 years later, and we know that uh, hadith was not written during the uh, time of the Prophet. How are we uh, going to make sure that hadith, hadith was preserved? You see, so there, there comes the doubt. Second thing they will say, I mean, different people, they will say, that hadith, the author, when, they, um, when they measured the authenticity, they only focused on the sanad, on the chain. They didn't put any value on the matan. Both these claims are totally false. I wouldn't go very much detail in um, the second one, just I want to make sure one, th one thing, that there are five conditions for a hadith to be sahih to be authentic. There are five conditions widely accepted among the muhaddisin. Three of them is on the basis of sanad. You know hadith has two parts. One is the isnad, sanad, the chain, someone narrated to someone uh, from na someone and then he, he narrated from someone, he narrated from a tabi and he narrated from a sahaba and he narrated from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa So this part is called chain, sanad. Actual text of the hadith is called matan. We, we, we can call it text, text of the hadith. Three of the conditions are based on the sanad. Two of the conditions are based, of, based on the text. So whoever says, comes to you and says that hadith only, authentication of hadith only consists of sanad, you know that they don't know anything about in regards to hadith. I wouldn't go into too much details on maybe in another khutbah. But the other point, when they say that, how would, you, would we know that hadith was preserved? A lot of the people, and including us, we believe, we actually had that information that hadith was not written during the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's time. However, this is not right. Initially, Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam forbade to write down hadith, initially. And the reason was, we all know that 
so that it doesn't get confused with the Quran. However, there are authentic narrations, authentic hadiths later on, shows that Rasulullah gave permission to write the hadith. And this hadith actually, um, um, uh, Mansukh, the previous hadith, where it says that you cannot write the hadith. Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al-As, he said, I used to write down the hadiths. And then the Quraysh came to me and told me that you are writing everything Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is saying where he is a human being. Then I got confused. I went to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and asked him. And then Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam pointed his finger to his tongue and said, by Allah, who, in, who, in whose hand my life is. Nothing comes out of this except the truth. He said, Uktub, right, because nothing comes out of this tongue, this mouth, except the truth. Also in Surah Najm, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَمَا يَنْتِقُ عَنِ الْهَوَىٰ إِنْ هُوَىٰ إِلَّا وَهِوِي يُوْهَىٰ Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa he doesn't say anything from his desires. Whatever he says is revelation. So whatever Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa says is wahi. On the basis of that, we know, on the basis of the hadith of Abdullah ibn Amr ibn Las, we know that it was being written that time. Also, during the last Hajj, um, uh, a, an old man came to Abu Shah, uh, named Abu Shah came to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and said that, Ya yeah, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, uh, make them to write the sermon for me. Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam asked uh, the writers to write the sermon for him and it was written. So these are evidences that hadith was being written during the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. After that, after his time, when the Sahaba's time came, there, it is well known that most of the big, uh, big scholars of the Sahabas, they had lots of students, they used to write hadith from him. Abdullah ibn Amr ibn Las had a sahifa written by himself called a sahifa sahiha with him. Seven students wrote from him. More than nine students wrote hadith from Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu. And to cut it short, recently, one of the scholars, his name was Muhammad Hamid, uh, Hamidullah in the 1920s, he discovered a scripture, discovered a script, um, a sahifa from, uh, in the museum in France. And that sahifa was of Hammam ibn Munabbi. Hammam ibn Munabbi was one of the students of Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu. And he used to write hadith under him. And this sahifa was written around 50 to 60 hijra. He written 137 hadith in that sahifa. And we know that Hammam ibn Munabih died in 110 hijri. So 137 um, hadith was written in this scripture. Recently, in the 1920s, this was discovered. Now. The strange, uh, uh, important thing is, all of these 137 hadiths are mentioned in, the Bukh in Bukhari and Muslim, or in both, word to word, exactly as the same. In Musnad Ahmad, the uh, largest known collection of hadiths by Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal, he has put the whole chapter one by one. So in his Musnad, you will find that 137 Hadiths one by one, one by one, one by one. So Bukhari died after 250. Ahmed uh, Ibn Hanbal died 241 Hijri. So they came after nearly about 200 years. They went through the hadiths through chains, and they reached exact same hadiths word by word. That explains how accurate the system of the hadith was at this collection. Barakallah hali wa lakum fi al-Qur'anil azim wa nafani wa iyaakum bima fihi min al-ayati wa zikri al-hakim. Aqulu qawli hadha, astaghfirullah hali wa lakum wa lisaili al-muslimina wa al-muslimat fastaghfirhu innahu ghafuru balu rahim.
Alhamdulillah Assalatu wassalamu ala rasulillah Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi Wa manistan nabi sunnatihi ila yawmiddin We don't have time today to go through the preservation of hadith However There is one logic you can apply for two minutes Very simple, very simple proof To understand that how hadith was preserved we all know the verse, Inna nahnu nazzalna zikra wa inna lahu lahafizun. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, We have revealed the zikr and we will protect it. Zikr means, most of the scholars, actually not most, most of the uh, scholars who we follow as authentic, they said that zikr here means Quran and Sunnah. So, eventually, that verse says that it will be protected. However, if we take the other opinion that zikr only means Quran, then in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in six places, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that we do not burden on any soul that is, he is not capable of. Allah doesn't burden us on anything that we are not capable of. Allah will not tell us to do something if we cannot do that. And in 70 verses, if you go to the Quran, in more than 70 verses, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has established the fact that we have to follow, we have to follow the sunnah. We have to follow the sunnah. I'm not going into the hadith. Only in the Quran, more than 70 verses, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Atiullaha wa atiur rasul. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also said, whatever the Prophet gives you, take. And whatever he prohibits, refrain from. So, if we do not know what sunnah is, how are you going to follow? Allah, say, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that follow the sunnah. And he says that we don't burden. I don't burden on you that you cannot do. So if the sunnah is not preserved, how are we going to act on it? Very simple logic. If you believe Islam, that is, the proof is in front of you. However, we should go and learn about the preservation of hadith. And then we will have strong beliefs in our heart, so that people cannot divide us, people cannot deviate us from the right track. In Allah's book, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Inna allaha wa malaikatahu yusalluna ala nabi, ya ayyuhal lazina amanu, sallu alayhi wa sallimu taslima. So we should do likewise. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala ali Muhammad, kama sallaita ala Ibrahim wa ala ali Ibrahim inna ka hamidun majid. Allahumma barik ala Muhammad wa ala ali Muhammad, kama barakta ala Ibrahim, وَعَلَىٰ آلِ إِبْرَاهِيمِ إِنَّكَ حَمِيدٌ مَجِيدٌ رَبَّنَا آتِنَا فِي الدُّنْيَا حَسَنَةً وَفِي الْآخِرَةِ حَسَنَةً وَكِنَا عَذَابَ النَّارِ رَبَّنَا هَبْ لَنَا مِنْ أَزْوَاجِنَا وَذُرِّيَّاتِنَا قُرَّةَ أَعْيُنٍ وَاجْعَلْنَا لِلْمُتَّقِينَ إِمَامًا رَبَّنَا اغْفِرْ لَنَا وَلِوَالِدَيْنَا وَلِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ يَوْمَ يَقُومُ الْحِسَابُ إِبَادَ اللَّهِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ يَأْمُرُ بِالْعَدْلِ وَالْإِحْسَانِ وَإِيتَاءِ ذِي الْقُرْبَى وَيَنْهَانِ الْفَحْشَاءِ وَالْمُنْكَرِ وَالْبَغْيِ يَئِذُكُمْ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَذَكَّرُونَ فَذْكُرُونِي أَذْكُرْكُمْ وَاشْكُرُوا لِي وَلَا تَكْفُرُونَ أَكِيمُ الصَّلَاةِ